for inviting me to uh, talk about my my research. Uh, I assume that uh, everyone has read my bio. So uh, I've taught at the University of Rochester all my career. And uh, uh, this is a, a paper that came out of a book that I wrote with Daniel Forrester. And uh, the book is, um, Relent, it's called Relentless, and it's uh, the Forensics of Mobsters Business Practices. What I'm going to be talking about tonight is uh, chapter three of uh, the book uh, on the American Mafia. Uh, the, the book analyzes three other organized crime syndicates that are primarily based in the United States uh, or Mexico, and the reason I uh, chose these is because there's just a great uh, deal of public information about uh, these uh, these organized crime syndicates. So uh, it was a lot easier to uh, get um, publicly available documents of of how they actually manage and uh, run themselves. Uh, most of my career has been working on looking at how control mechanisms and, and governance mechanisms operate in for-profit legal organizations. And we often see organizations, legal organizations uh, collapse and fail because of, of massive um, lack of controls. And we're seeing that unfold now with the FTX uh, uh, crypto exchange meltdown where there were absolutely no controls and there was just uh, the ability of the founder to move money in and out of uh, his various entities. Uh, and there was absolutely no controls. And, and that's what led to the collapse. So, you know, we, we have a whole literature of uh, massive uh, uh, for-profit uh, failures uh, from Enron to, um, uh, uh, I, uh, ING and, and lots of companies worldwide. Uh, and this is kind of the flip side of that. Th this is unlawful firms that have survived long periods of time. And so they must have control mechanisms uh, that have been working there. And so the question is, what do they look like and how they evolved? So before I start, uh, let me just make the point that the paper is not trying to rom romanticize or rationalize the mafia. Uh, these are typically evil, despicable people. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, this is no way to be interpreted as a tribute to them. However, just like we study failed for-profit firms, uh, and people are going to be looking and studying what happened to the FTX exchange, crypto exchange. Um, what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the management processes that these pretty evil people figured out how to uh, devise to control the people in there. And uh, what these management processes have to do like a for-profit firm is that they have to channel the mobsters criminal self-interest to supply illegal goods and services to generate profits. And at the same time, they have to be eluding law enforcement and other rival bad guys. Uh, when you look at the amount of resources that uh, countries spend trying to control uh, these criminal organizations, it's quite remarkable that they're able to survive as long as they have. The, the American Mafia was uh, has been in existence uh, for over 100 years, and there's not very many for-profit companies around the world that have survived that far, that long. So um, the other point that struck me is that we take for granted the these institutions that have arise that have grown up 
that really facilitate uh, commercial transactions. We take for granted things like banks uh, that facilitate financial transactions and credit. Uh, we take for granted courts that enforce contracts and insurance companies that insure all sorts of risks. Well, illegal organized criminals cannot use these typical institutions to facilitate their trade. So that imposes an additional cost or barrier uh, on them. So how do they do this? And that's what we're gonna talk about for about 25 or 30 minutes. Well, what they did was that they've solved the corporate governance problems that a lot of firms haven't solved. And what they have to do is they have to uh, have management processes that can attract, retain, and motivate their members. And they have to do that in order to generate profits and to survive. And so the paper's key takeaways are that there are essentially four management systems that uh, these all of these organized syndicates that I look at in the book uh, are complements. And what they do is that they are able to um, allow the mafia to evolve as environmental threats and challenges face them. The four pillars and the fourth pillar, I'll talk about the other three. The fourth pillar is corporate culture. And in these organizations, it's extremely important. It's probably more important uh, than at least a couple of the others. So what is the fourth pillar? It basically defines and communicates the often immoral values held by members of the mafia. And it attracts people with these values. These are people who, who don't uh, mind committing violence. Uh, they reward, the, the culture rewards productive mafia, members of the mafia with safety, a sense of belonging, and a lot of camaraderie and recognition. Being in one of, in one of these uh, mafia families uh, was quite a honor in the neighborhood uh, to, to have been accepted into the gang. The other key point is that the, the uh, lawful managers cannot merely copy the mafia's four pillars. They have to use the same economic principles to devise optimal structures that match their particular strategy and circumstances. So I'm not saying that you know if you're running a, a company in Singapore, that you merely copy what the mafia is doing. You obviously can't do that. You can't take somebody around the back of the building and beat them up. Uh, so you don't have that, that mechanism, but you do have other mechanisms. So let me, let me start with talking about uh, what economists have described as the agency problem. And the agency problem is, you know, how do you attract, retain, and motivate, motivate self-interested workers to to execute the firm's strategy? How do you get them to behave in the, in the, in the firm's best interest and not in their own self-interest? And this has been a huge field in uh, managerial economics and in, and in accounting. And clearly both lawful, for all lawful firms have to solve this problem, but so do unlawful firms. And how do you, how do you align the firm's strategy and employee incentives. That's basically the agency problem. And the history of the mafia illustrates how it solved this problem. So let me talk a little bit about the mafia in the United States. Uh, there's been lots of movies and television shows. The Sopranos uh, is the godfather or probably the two uh, most well-known media uh, shows, but there's been just a whole, you know, probably hundreds and hundreds of uh, media, uh, TV shows and movies about the mafia. Well, 
the mafia is um, goes back to Sicily uh, several fa thousand years ago in Sicily when these local clans, villagers, uh, would, would arise in the village to protect the people in the village from occupying powers. For a thousand years, Sicily had been occupied by virtually everybody, and they were always subjugated by the foreign rulers. And so the foreigners didn't really have a lot of interest in maintaining order uh, and justice within a, the village. So the villagers turned to and, uh, the, the elders in these uh, villages, people they called men of honor, to basically become uh, a, um, uh, a de facto government to um, dispense justice, to settle disputes, uh, and to provide effectively a court system. And in order to survive, they, and, and from the uh, people who were occupying them, they developed this code of silence. The idea is you don't talk to, to the people who've invaded us. You don't snitch on a local villager to uh, the Roman uh, occupiers or the Greek occupiers. And there was enormous loyalty to the family and the family, it was an extended family and, and hence to the clan. Between 1890 and 1920, 4 million or more Italians and Sicilians immigrated to the United States because of problems uh, in Italy and Sicily drove them there. The vast majority of them settled in New York City because that's where um, the port of immigration entry was. And they would tend to settle in neighborhoods around New York City where they had family. So people who were coming from a particular uh, city in Sicily like Palermo, they would tend to go to that neighborhood in New York City where they had friends and family from that same village that they knew. And all, eventually all American cities of any size had local mafias or Italian immigrants, you should say. Uh, Italian immigrants settled in, in all American cities, but the vast majority of them stayed in uh, the New York metropolitan area. And they began, a uh, few of them who were associated with these mafia clans in the old country, brought their ways with them, and they started doing the same sort of illegal activities of extortion, gambling, and bootlegging, which was basically uh, making uh, alcohol in, in your basement. And the reason they do it is that they, they didn't have to pay uh, any sort of tax on it. So, up until 1920, there was the, there were these large Italian neighborhoods, and a few of the people who were living there uh, were engaged in these uh, minor uh, vices of gambling and bootlegging. They organized themselves around five families, and these were five neighborhoods or boroughs in New York City, and. Um, most of them spoke no English. There was enormous discrimination against the Italians. It was hard for them to get jobs. Uh, there was, um, it was hard to get into schools. And so a lot of them were just scraping by. Well, what happened is in 1920, the United States banned all alcohol consumption. And this was a nation, nationwide prohibition that was passed in 1920. And this law just supercharged these local neighborhood gangs of kids. Most of these local mafias, they were uh, 19, 20, 21 year old kids. Didn't, they couldn't get jobs. They were you know, gambling on the street. They were doing petty crimes. All of a sudden, everyone wants alcohol. Well, a lot of these people, these Italians were already making alcohol because they couldn't afford to buy alcohol 
in liquor stores because of the high taxes. And um, one of the more famous of these um, uh, mafia kids was Lucky Luciano, who in 1925 was generating revenues of $12 million on the sale of alcohol with a net profit of $4 million. Now you, you know, inflation adjusts that, you get a pretty big number in today's dollars. He had a uh, hundred man payroll and he was paying a lot of money to the police for protection. And with that kind of what well, he had these five families, you'd expect that there would be a lot of uh, conflict. There'd be people trying to poach each other's neighborhoods or steal each other's uh, liquor. They were smuggling in liquor from Canada, from Cuba. They were making a lot of it in, in house. And so there was a lot of crime and theft among the families. There were wars, there were big wars. Um, between these families, the five families. And Lucky Luciano, this guy, uh, after he emerges from one of these wars, he sits down with the other four families and sets up what they call the commission. And it was to stop these mafia wars that were uh, going on ever since the um, prohibition not not nearly as bad as what we're seeing in the Mexican cartels, uh, but it was a lot of uh, fighting and um, and this was just bad for business. So in 1931, they they got together and they formed this what they called the commission, and it's basically the heads of the five families are like a board of directors, and they coordinate the activities among the five families. They decide who gets to sell alcohol in which neighborhoods, who's running the gambling in what neighborhoods, who's doing uh, prostitution. And um, it eventually grows into about 10 of the most powerful crime families, Italian families in North America, including Canada. And so the commission uh, was this device that was created in order to reduce the amount of conflict and, and brutal uh, behavior among the, these families. So what the commission does is it basically, if, um, if a member of another family uh, does something that the, the the other families don't like, the commission can approve the murder of that person uh, in another family. But the other four bosses have to uh, do that. They also had a rule that prohibited murdering law enforcement officers because that was bad for business. The interesting thing was that they prohibited female members. Uh, and we can we can talk about that, but one of the things you tend to observe across every organized crime syndicate that I've looked at is that it's very rare where females uh, are even involved in uh, the organized crime activities, except maybe on the periphery. They also limit the size of each family so that one family wouldn't get so big that it, it had more soldiers and guns uh, than the other families. It also approves who can be appointed the boss of each family. And the fascinating thing is that since this commission was set up in 1931, there were basically no wars among the families not just the five families in New York, but the families in these other uh, American and Canadian cities. Well, uh, all good things must come to an end. Uh, and prohibition was, was repealed. Uh, by the time it was repealed in 1933, these families had made enormous money. Uh, they'd become very rich. And when they lost the sale of illegal alcohol, 
they uh, and the, the five families that survived were have become very efficient illegal organizations. They had deep um, uh, bribe. You know, they they bribed all of the local courts, police. Uh, at one time, there was a. Uh, a statistic that 70% of the New York City police force was getting bribes from uh, mafia families. And so what they had to do was they had to turn to other remaining vices, uh, which they had already been doing, but then they, they really poured their efforts into this. The thing that was striking about, especially the mafia, was how resourceful and relentless these people were at finding new unlawful enterprises once they couldn't sell uh, alcohol uh, to people who couldn't get it legally. So just to give you a few examples, the paper has a lot more of them. Um, when World War II started in the United States, uh, the United States, like most other combatants, had to ration basic supplies. Uh, so you couldn't, in order to, to get sugar, gas, tires, almost anything, you had to have coupon books. Well, the mafia saw the, the profit opportunities and they started counterfeiting and stealing and uh, bribing government officials for these coupon books. Uh, in 1950s, as, as labor unions started to become big and powerful, uh, the mafia muscled their way in um, and took over these unions because they not only stole the pension funds that were in there, but they were able to use their violence to intimidate business, legal businesses to cooperate and uh, bring in the union. So if you were a non-unionized textile shop, a garment maker in New York City, and the garment workers come in and you say, well, we, my workers don't want to join the union. Well, you better join the union or you, you're gonna be visited late at night by one of the mafia guys. Uh, they also started um, rigging cart, uh, legal cartels. They created cartels to rig, rig bids in, again, New York City for if you want to buy concrete uh, or if you want to hire an electrician, uh, you had to um, bid this out on a, on a contract and the mafia made sure that the, the all of the other cement contracts uh, cement companies put in much higher bids than the one that they uh, were supporting and they rotated the winning bid and it led to the fact that concrete in New York City was something like 50% higher than any place else in the, in, the, in the country and it was because of the mafia enforced cartel. As New York City started to raise cigarette taxes on cigarettes, um, the mafia again saw an opportunity where they could go to a state, another state, uh, and buy the cigarettes where they have very low taxes, smuggle them into New York City, and sell them, uh, and basically make the they're paying themselves the taxes instead of the city. Uh, again, something like seventy-five or eighty percent of all cigarettes sold in New York City were um, illegal smuggled in. Um, well, all of this started to change in the 70s when the United States passed a legislation called the RICO statute that basically uh, allows a federal prosecutor to put in jail a boss as long as they can show that there's a conspiracy. So if the, it, you, it was the case that if you want to convict somebody of a crime, you have to show that they actually committed the crime, that they stole the cigarettes. Well, the boss of the family is not going out stealing cigarettes 
or buying cigarettes in, in uh, one state and smuggling them in. He's not going to be caught doing that. All that you now have to do to catch the boss is to show a, a, a conspiracy. And you can build a conspiracy case by wiretapping uh, the phone lines of these people. And if you can catch them on the phone calls talking to their uh, lower level people that they were engaged in criminal activity, then they can go away uh, under the, the RICO statute. And that changed the whole game for law enforcement. Um, the infamous now Rudy Giuliani made his name uh, by putting most of the mafia bosses in jail in the 70s and with uh, very long sentences. And so that tended to create in bigger incentives for people to cooperate with the government, lower level criminals to uh, snitch on their bosses. And this significantly weakened the mafia to the point that it was probably 10% the, the size that it was at it, it, its height. Today, there's still uh, mafia, several thousand of them, primarily around the New York City area. Uh, they're still involved in gambling, loan sharking. They've gotten into Ill, illegal prescriptions um, and offshore gambling, things like that. Uh, the um, it it's really caused that you know as the discrimination against the Italians have has really gone away uh, compared to the way it was in the 1900s. There's a smaller cadre of people who are who want to go into organized crimes. There's just too many. The opportunity cost of their time is too high. Uh, to go into crime now. So that's also reduced the supply of uh, these illegal criminals. So let me go back and talk about these practices, that what we've learned uh, from all of this. And that is that um, uh, you've got the empowerment task assignment pillar. You have performance measures. Uh, you have rewards and punishments. And you have corporate culture. And it's these four management practices that when built and refined really can supercharge an organization. Again, all organizations have these four pillars and uh, you, how well they are constructed can really force a company to be either successful or unsuccessful. So for example, uh, we know that there was no uh, control mechanisms in FTX uh, exchange, and it collapsed. So the first pillar is task assignments. Who makes what decisions? And this is the fundamental question of an organization chart. How do you assign tasks to people? And you want to assign tasks to people that have the skills, the best information to make the decision and incentives to exercise uh, the task in the firm's interest and not their own self-interest. So here's a picture of a typical mafia family, one of the five that shows the commission. And then under the commission, you have the boss of each family and um, go down to the purple level under the um, the boss, he, the, he has a number of capos, or, uh, and these capos are captains who then have under them um, people who are called made men. These made guys are people who've been in the organization for anywhere from 10 to 15 years and who are then formally admitted to be a member of the family. And once you're a member of the family, uh, you can't get killed by anybody outside of the family unless uh, the commission approves it. Uh, each of these captains then has a, a, a number of us made men who report to him who are running crews of associates. So 
you can think of this as uh, one of these made guys might be in charge of a gambling house. Uh, and he has a number of associates who are running that gambling house. So there could be another guy who's running a different gambling house. There could be another cap capo who's running, um, uh, let's say, um, a, 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 in the in the airports stealing freight as it's coming in and off of airplanes. And so people are specializing by crime. And you can think of these as little franchises that each captain will have a franchise to do certain vices in a neighborhood. And he has people under him who are doing this. And again, you have five of these families in New York. Then you have a family like this in Buffalo, Kansas City, uh, San Francisco, and, and so on and so forth. So the boss is main job is to take the long view. He maintains order, maximizes the family's profit. He has sole decision making authority within his territory. So he might have a neighborhood called the, like the Bronx in New York City. And he can do all of the crime he wants in that area. He chooses the people under him. Uh, he assigns what illegal businesses to each of the, the, the people in his family. And he, they basically divide the profits up. And they call it a tribute where um, whatever uh, one of these local, let me go back here. One of these little local cells down here, um, a made guy who has associates. These associates are people who work for him, but they are not formally members of the family yet. Uh, and what they do is whatever profits they make, they keep 85% of it. And uh, the other 15% is passed up to the, the capo and eventually to the boss. Uh, so uh, the other thing he does is anyone who gets arrested, he bails them out and he also takes care of their family. Let me skip over these guys. Uh, the coppos and the made men, these are the guys who are running the day-to-day -day rackets. And there's usually five or six made men or made guys under each captain. captain. Uh, and the soldiers are made up of these made guys and associates, and they form these crews. They're very entrepreneurial. They specialize by vice. And um, the task assignments. So let's look at the how tasks are assigned within this organization. Again, the commission assigns the territories and adjudicates disputes. They don't tell the families how to run the business in their neighborhoods. The boss retains very high level decision making, uh, he, but he doesn't get involved in telling the captains what to do. It's the captains or the capos who make all the decisions over their crews and uh, assigns them uh, to, to various jobs. And they have the best knowledge of what's going on in their vice and in their neighborhood. So notice that this co-locates co decision authority and, and knowledge. You wanna give decisions to people who have the knowledge. And the, and the mafia did that in a very decentralized way. How do they measure performance? It was simple, cash. It's not accrual accounting. Uh, it was not a balanced scorecard. It was easy to measure. It was cash and it was also loyalty. If the boss calls you up and tells you to do something at two o'clock in the morning, you do it. Uh, rewards and punishments. Again, it was very simple. Uh, and very powerful. They keep 75, 70 to 85% of, of whatever they steal. Uh, and the hitmen, uh, the other reward was promotions. People really wanted to be in the mafia. These, these associates wanted to become a, a wise guy because uh, it conferred a lot of status uh, on them in the neighborhood. People misunderstand violence as used as a punishment. 
they certainly did a lot of beating, beat, beatings uh, for stealing, but there was really very little uh, violence relative to the size of these organizations. Uh, it was really more used as a deterrent than as actual violence. You don't want to beat up or actually kill uh, uh, somebody who's gambling, one of your gambling customers, and they don't pay their gambling debt. You kill them, you're not going to get anything. So it was really more uh, a, a threat. Finally, it's the culture, which um, was really a key part of the motivating systems in, in these uh, uh, organizations. These people were resourceful, uh, entrepreneurial, and uh, they were always looking for a way to make or steal some money. And the other value they had was that they were immoral. They knew the difference between right and wrong, but they really didn't care. Uh, so they had these very strong cultural norms. I'll let you read about those um, since I'm kind of running out of time here. Uh, the other interesting thing they did was that one of the FBI informants who infiltrated one of these gangs talked about how they would go to the club, the drinking club, at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, and they sit around all day planning their jobs. And um, it was basically a team building exercise. It reinforced the loyalty to the family, and it was a way they could keep track of each other. Uh, if somebody didn't show up to the club, the first suspicion was, well, is he talking to the cops? Uh, so it was a way to have face-to-face -face communications. It was a way to reduce the likelihood of wiretaps. They, they knew that their phone lines were bugged, so they tried to avoid that. Uh, so what are the important forensic findings here? Uh, let me, here's kind of the organization, here's the, or, the chart that uh, kind of puts everything in, in uh, one in perspective. Every organization faces external market factors like technology changes, competition, COVID. Uh, whenever you have external factors, that's going to affect the firm's strategy and brand. And eventually, the four pillars are going to have to adjust. And that's what we, um, we see in, uh, in this case. So I've already talked about uh, prohibition and how that led to boot, bootlegging. Uh, World War II rationing then led to counterfeiting and high cigarette taxes led to uh, the cigarette smuggling. So as the external environment changed, the mafia was very quick to adapt uh, to new strategies. And when they did that, they had to adjust their four pillars. So the biggest adjustment of the four pillars was uh, the creation of the commission. And that was, that again, that was in response to these wars that were breaking out. Uh, and they finally figured out how to solve that problem. Okay, so let me kind of get down to the key punchlines here. Notice that the four pillars really complement each other, that the tasks are assigned to people who have the best knowledge. Their performance measures really measured how they were, um, how efficient they were at generating criminal profits. And they had these simple rewards and punishments. And in fact, the probably the most powerful one was they get to keep a large fraction of what they uh, were able to generate. So keeping 75 or 80%, they're going to have more incentive to, to boost or steal another truck of uh, fur coats than if they only kept 5 or 10% of it. Uh, okay, so uh, the four pillars. The other thing you hear a lot about in, in corporate media is how short-term 
focused. A lot of managers are. They're only focused on the next quarterly results. The mafia took a very long-term view of things. Uh, they had very long apprenticeships. Before an associate could be admitted to a family, he had to work for 10 or 20 years to show his loyalty. Uh, they, this is probably the best example of how they shun short-termism. They would not allow anyone to kill a law enforcement or a judge. Uh, so if you were facing um, a five-year prison term and you went out and killed the, the policeman who had evidence uh, that you committed the crime, well, you could save maybe a five-year sentence, but in the long run, it's going to be very bad for business because uh, law enforcement is going to take its revenge on the, the family. Okay, so it, it remains successful. Um, there were, you always read about mafia in New York City being arrested for various uh, crimes. And so uh, let me just conclude here quickly that uh, these were highly efficient organizations. Uh, they um, had this very decentralized structure uh, that allowed them protection from law enforcement. And finally, as I said before, you just can't copy the mafia's four pillars, but you have to understand how to shape these four pillars for the strategy and the circumstances of your firm. So let me just kind of wrap it up here and see if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Jerry. Very, very excellent uh, presentation. And apologies, I um, joined in, uh, just after you'd started. So uh, questions and answers. We have a question uh, uh, by Habeshek. You mentioned mafia. You mentioned that mafia mastered corporate governance. And I think it was interested in, you know, why you've used the word mastered corporate governance to justify, you know, obviously organized crime, you know, breaking the law of violence. And it is just wondering, what, you know, the relationship between that and good corporate governance practices. Well, you know, a good corporate practice, it's this is a tautology in the sense that uh, a good corporate practice is good for you. Uh, and what's good for you is not necessarily good for another company because every company has its own strategy. The, the corporate governance of Apple uh, is different than the corporate governance, uh, the internal one. Yeah, when I'm talking about the, the governance, I'm talking about these four internal pillars, and uh, they're going to be different in, in Apple than they are in Amazon uh, or in Southwest Airlines or in Singapore Airlines, because they all have very different strategies, and they have to employ people who can implement those strategies. So you know what what's a good corporate governance in uh, uh, Singapore Airways is unlikely to be good corporate governance in um, Amazon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. We've got another question. Which you think, you know, anyone would be curious about. How do you research going into the mafia world? Isn't that dangerous? No, uh, because there's an enormous, um, enormous amount of information in the public domain. Uh, I, uh, I interviewed some law enforcement people, and I interviewed uh, a couple of attorneys who are defense attorneys who who worked with these people, but there's nothing in the book that isn't in the public domain. Thank you. Thanks, Abhishek and Thiru, for, for your questions. Uh, and many thanks, Jerry. I think there was a lot around the, the adaptive and dynamic organizational strategies, and it was good 
you know, describing how you described how that was as a response to the external environment. And you can draw a comparison between, if you like, uh, private sector enterprises and, and how some of those strategies can be useful. Uh, you also talked about what sounds like meritocracy and how they assigned their responsibility, but also their reward and incentive mechanisms. Uh, it was also intriguing when you talked about non short terminism and how they they use that and perhaps, you know, uh, uh, business leaders of today and how incentives and reward systems of senior managers are designed. Perhaps there's something to, to also learn there. Uh, I, was, I was also interested in whether in the course of your research, you looked at interna other international contexts, perhaps non-US context, maybe non-New York specific context, and whether uh, there were similarities between, if you like, the US experience and other, uh, certainly non-Italian, uh, but yeah. international uh, yeah. case studies, uh, where I, th yeah. there was, you know, a similar case study you could you could talk about. Uh, <clears throat> the, the the biggest contrast was between the the, the mafia and the the Mexican cartels, and the Sinaloa cartel, which at the time was the biggest one. And what we've seen is that the, Me the Mexican cartels are killing each other off at enormous rates. And it's just terrible violence and terrible, terrible things are happening in, in Mexico. And Mexico tried to actually form their own uh, commission. They called it the Federation. And uh, back in the 70s, the various Mexican cartel leaders sat down and actually had a, a, a federation where they tried to work these things out. But it was impossible to enforce because, um, and it, it was the same problem that OPEC has. You know, OPEC has a terrible problem trying to enforce its cartel. It's too easy to cheat. Uh, what made the mafia successful at forming this, think of it as a board of directors that limits violence. Um, it was easy to, to monitor if someone was cheating. If someone opens up a, a, a prostitution brothel outside of their neighborhood, that's easily observed. Uh, if someone is um, opening up a gambling house outside of their neighborhood, that's easily observed and can be policed. But all of the Mexican cartels, are, are they have one market. It's the United States and primarily, and they're trying to get drugs into the United States, and they're all selling the same thing. And the other thing is the, the margins are incredible on drugs as opposed to uh, the, the criminal activities of the mafia. You know, you can uh, buy cocaine in South America and sell it in the United States at a thousand percent markup. Well, that gives you enormous incentives to cheat, uh, whereas there's not a lot of nearly as much margin in running a gambling operation or prostitution or things like that. So uh, again, the basic economics of the, the costs of cheating and the incentives to cheat can ex explain to me why there's so much more violence in Mexico than there was in the United States. Good. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got a, a few questions. We'll, we'll try to, to take as many of them as possible. So uh, another question from Thiru. Sounds to the United States of America, the drug cartels. How has America protected itself from, other, from often lawlessness cartels taking root in the States? What, what was it? I, what is the United States doing about it? Yes. Nothing. <laughs> is a simple, it, unfortunately, I mean, I don't know if you've been following the statistics on fentanyl uh, drug overdoses. They're up three, four hundred percent. It's all coming in over this, uh, the Mexican border. And again, the, the margins are just incredible. And 
law enforcement is overwhelmed and um, uh, there's really not a good, good solution. Thank you. Rather, rather slightly depressing. Uh, two questions from Abigail. You mentioned the mafia gets the right person to do the right job and them being very loyal. Isn't that the same concept as chronism? And second question, did you see any cases of how they removed people who were not efficient in doing the job? So was it chronism at play and how did they remove people not efficient in doing their job? Well, I don't think there was much cronyism. I mean, it was, um, uh, it was, uh, a, you know, you worked your way up into these families and these people uh, would start when they were nine, 10, 11 years old. They'd be, you know, going out and getting a newspaper or delivering some money to a, a cop or something like that. And over a period of 10 years, people who either weren't loyal or weren't very good at things, they just never made it into the family. Uh, the, um, and so it was very much a meritocracy. Uh, there wasn't a cronyism there. Uh, most of the people who, who started in this, they, again, remember, these were large extended families in these neighborhoods where everybody knew everybody in, in these Italian families. They all went to the same church. And, um, and so there were some kids who would, uh, who wanted to follow their uncle Vinny into the business. And, and uh, they wouldn't take these kids in if they were troublemakers, if they knew that they weren't gonna do what they were told to do. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. Uh, a question that, that tries to relate to your, your four pillars to, to, if you like, corporate governance of family businesses. So corporate governance of family businesses can often minimize the principal agency problem, but often that could also lead to some challenges of internal audit and risk management, etc. So do you think your four pillars can help with, you know, uh, corporate governance of family businesses in this area? Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, um, when you think about what the, some of the conflicts of interests are within a family business, the ones I've seen is um, intergenerational conflicts of interest, where uh, the the, let's say the, the father who starts the business and is now 60, 65 years old uh, and is turn, turning the business over to a son or a grandson even, um, and the grandson or son wants to grow the business and work hard, and the father doesn't want to do that or is too risk averse. And so I've seen a lot of family businesses kind of fall apart because the younger generation has a different set of objectives than the older generation. And now the question is, well, how do you solve that problem? Well, depends on the, the, the nature of the family business. You know, one thing is just buy the father out. But again, a lot of times the father does want to be bought out, that they want to keep be continue to be boss. Um, you know, one way, you know, is there some way that you can somehow segregate the company into parts for the old people or the young people. Uh, but passing the baton is, it's kind of in the family business, not all that dissimilar than um, how a public company goes from gen one generation to another. Thank you, thank you very much. Thinking in the interest of time, uh, we 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 we'll stop the, the the session now. I'll just ask one final question. And many of us would have seen Narcos and on on Netflix and El Chapo and some of these uh, series. I just wondered how realistic and close to reality those depictions of of mafias and, and Narcos. Uh, are real, you know, given your own research experience. And I'm sure you've seen those movies as well. Uh, I do. And 
Uh, they're, you know, I think that they portray a lot more violence than is really actually happened. Um, it was certainly the case that Chapo was uh, a violent guy, but um, I think it's more uh, a disconnect with uh, the mafia. Again, there weren't a lot of mafia violence uh, incidents, but when you watch The Godfather or you watch uh, any of these other movies, uh, violent sales. People want to see crimes. They don't want to see guys sitting around uh, drinking and uh, having fun. I mean, that's not good good TV show. So, uh, you know, a lot of what I did was actually read autobiographies of of uh, criminals, uh, and they're you know th they're biased in the other direction. But uh, you know, you also get informants that sit down and then they'll publish a book. So uh, again, it's like everything else. You have to take what you see with a grain of salt. But you know, if you flip through the paper, the book, uh, there's just enormous amounts of referencing there and cross-referencing. So listen, thank you very much. This was a lot of fun and uh, glad you could make it. Yes, yes, thank you very much, Jerry. I'm very grateful for your time. And uh, thank you, colleagues, for joining in. Um, I want to thank you sincerely, uh, Jerry, for, for taking the time out of your very busy uh, schedule to, to talk to us. And big thanks to, to Thiru, to colleagues, uh, Nicola, to Erica, uh, who, and Abigail who, who helped put this together. So uh, EOS seminars will continue next year. I want to take this opportunity to wish everyone uh, a happy holiday and uh, see you in the new year. Thank you very much again, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.